And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and a very happy new year to everyone watching. I'm here again in front of the whiteboard. And what a blessing it is to be here with you again as we go to the scriptures and look at what the Bible says. This will be our first sermon for 2020, the new year. And I want to start it off with a bang. I figured let's talk about the possibility, the question of could the rapture be this year? Boy, fingers crossed, I hope so. I get emails all the time from people that say, Brother Breaker, I'm just so ready for Jesus to return. This world is not what it should be. The world is going against God. There's all this talk of, of war, and things are just scary. All the danger and everything bad that's going on in the world. And they say, Brother Breaker, what does the Bible say? And I enjoy uh, reading the scriptures and looking for the return of Christ. I get emails, I get phone calls from people all the time. Brother Breaker, I'm reading my Bible, what about this? Brother Breaker, hey, have you read this passage? What about this? And a lot of folks are studying their Bibles and looking for the return of Jesus Christ. And that's wonderful, that's wonderful. So let's start today in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm just going to ask the question, could the rapture be in 2020? So 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says this, in 2 Timothy 4, 8, we read, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. When will he appear? Well, Jesus Christ appears at the rapture. And the Bible says right there that if you love the Lord, and you're looking for his soon return, and you love his appearing, then guess what? You're going to get a crown. And that crown comes for loving His appearing. I love Him so much for what He's done for me. He died on the cross for my sins, shed His blood for me. Who am I? Nobody. But what I am is I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And because He died for me, because He shed His blood for me, because of all that He's done for me, I want to do for Him. But I also love His appearing. I love His coming. I can't wait for Him to come back. And I love to talk about it. And the Bible says that I'm going to get a crown in heaven because I love His appearing. How about you? And in Revelation 3.11, it warns us about someone who would try to take your crown. Matter of fact, let's go there real quick. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. Jesus is speaking here. And in Revelation 3.11, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. All right, Jesus is coming quickly, so I'm looking for His return. I can't wait. Behold, I come with quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. There's some people out there that want to take away your crown. People out there claim to be Christians say, oh, you should never talk about the rapture. Never talk about when Jesus is coming. Why? That's none of our business. You shouldn't talk about that. They're trying to take your crown. They want you to get your eyes off of the return of Christ, Him coming back for His bride. They want you to think about other things. Many of them, a bunch of troublemakers, rubble rousers. Just trying to stir, stir up strife in the body of Christ. That's a shame. But I love the Lord, and I love His appearing, and I love His coming, so I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. Titus chapter 2. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some interesting verses. Make you think. Stimulate you to want to read the Bible. That's my desire, because the Bible says to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We should be studying the Bible, seeing what it says, rightly dividing. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15, talking about Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope. Well, that's the rapture. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you looking? Who gave himself for us. When? When he died on the cross. He shed his blood for our sins. And we're saved by faith. Faith in the blood of Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Look at what verse 15 says. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So we're going to talk about today the coming of Christ. And could it be in 2020? Well, I hope so. Are you looking for His appearing? Are you loving His appearing? Are you desirous of Christ's return? Paul tells us that the church, he's espoused to Christ as a chaste virgin. 
So to his bride. So what it is, is the church is the bride. And the bridegroom is Jesus. So the bridegroom, Jesus, wants to come and get his bride. Well, guess what? What bride doesn't look forward to the day of her wedding? I've talked to many women, and I haven't met very many women who, who told me, boy, the day I got married was the worst day of my life. I never looked forward to that. I thought it was horrible. <laughs> I've never heard that. They've always said, oh, I couldn't wait till the day I got married. And I was planning it, and I was picking out this, and I was looking for the, and getting my gown, and I just, I couldn't wait for the day of my wedding. Well, he takes us up at the rapture, Jesus takes us, and we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it's a glorious day, the rapture. It's a wonderful time. It's a time that I'm looking for, and I love, and I can't wait for Jesus to come back. How about you? Now, Lately, there's been some people say, well, you should never, ever try to talk about this kind of stuff, and you shouldn't try to figure out when Jesus is coming back, and things like that. And the Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus is coming back. And I look at that and I go, do you read your Bible? I was thinking about this today, and I wrote this down. Clues to when Jesus is coming back. Do you know in the Bible there are so many clues as to when Jesus is coming? I looked at the Bible and I'm like, there are so many clues as to when Jesus is coming back. And if we love him, we should be reading the scriptures and looking for those clues. I remember before I was married, I would write letters to my wife. And I was in Honduras, so I'd have to write from Honduras. She'd write me letters back. I couldn't wait to get those letters. I couldn't wait to read those letters. I couldn't wait to read in between the lines, so to speak, and see, was she saying this? Was she thinking this? Oh, when she wrote that sentence, did her heart skip a beat because she cares? I loved reading what my future wife had to say. And she told me years later, boy, I couldn't wait for your letters. Well, the Bible is our love letter from God. And we're going to marry Him someday. So we should be reading that and looking at that book and thinking, He's coming for me. When is He coming? I can't wait. And if you really love Him, you're going to read it more and look for that coming. So there are some clues in the Bible. Now, I've had people say, well, Brother Baker, the Bible doesn't tell us when the rapture is. And I go, D dude, do you read the Bible? Okay, let's go. I didn't have it here in the notes, so let's, let's go out of the notes. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. I get attacked all the time by people. And one of the things that they claim to have against Robert Breaker is they say, well, Robert Breaker believes that you can find out when the rapture is if you read the Bible. And I'm like, yeah, that's what the Bible says. But they will go over to, to um, Matthew, and in Matthew, Jesus says, No man knoweth the day or hour. And they say, No man knoweth the day or hour. Well, that's what Jesus said here during his earthly ministry. But God gave us the book of Revelation over here. Now, this is after this. <laughs> so when Jesus said, No man knoweth the day or hour, while he was in his earthly ministry on earth, he said that then. But the Bible tells us that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When he rose again, he went up to heaven. And if you go to the book of Revelation, well, I ask you to turn to 3 3, and we will turn there, but look at 1 1. In Revelation, and, and back here, Jesus said, No man knoweth the day or hour except my Father. So the Father in heaven knew the day and the hour. Well, Jesus rose from the dead, went up to heaven where the Father is. And would have spoken to the Father. Do you think that the Father would have told the Son, Hey, guess what? You're getting married soon, and guess when you're coming back? You mean to tell me in heaven, the Father hasn't revealed to His Son the wedding date yet? That doesn't make much sense to me. What does Revelation 1-1 say? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto Him. Who would that be? God the Father. So God the Father told the Son something which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. <laughs> so the book of Revelation is given to tell us of the things future. Now, with that stated, go with me to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. People say, well, the, the rapture is not in the Bible. We don't know when the rapture will be. Nobody can ever know the day or the hour. According to you, because you take one verse out of context, and you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you go to something Jesus said back here. You don't read what he said over here. Let's see what the Bible says. 
Jesus speaking, of course, in Revelation 3.3. Jesus says in Revelation 3.3, 3, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. And you trolls, you need to repent. <laughs> if, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So Jesus is speaking, and he says if you do not watch, he says dot dot dot, you will not know. Now what is the opposite of that? The opposite of that is if you watch dot 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 you will know. Do you see that? You take that statement and Jesus says if you're not watching you won't know what hour. So what is he saying? He's saying if you are watching then you can know the hour. So I get a lot of flack from people because people say, Brother Breaker says you can know when Jesus is coming back by reading your Bible. What a heretic, Robert Breaker. And I read my Bible and I say, but it says if you're watching, you can know. And then it uses the word the hour. <laughs> so whenever these people say these things, I just look at them and go, do you even read your Bible? Don't give me this. Don't, don't tell me you know what you're talking about. I give you the Bible. They give you their opinion. Which do you want? I'd rather choose the Word of God. Amen? So, D Robert Breaker teaches, I believe it's possible that we could know. I don't say I do. I'm not on this video going to tell you, on such and such a day, at such and such an hour, Jesus will return. I don't know that. But I do know the book of Revelation was given us to know of things that will shortly come to pass. And there are many, many clues in the Scriptures of when Jesus is coming back. Let me give you seven clues that the Bible gives us of the return of Christ. I believe that it's in the Bible somewhere, the date of the rapture. I, can, I don't claim to have found it yet, but I do believe it's there. And that's why I love reading and studying and looking, because I'm looking for His return. Now the first clue is, is in Hosea chapter 6. So in Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 through 2, is the first clue. And this clue is within several thousand years. So let me put that in. Somewhere around 2,000 years. Now let's go to Hosea chapter 6. If you study your Bible, it'll sure help you to not say silly dumb things. You know the Bible tells us to speak evil of no man. I know these people that are my trolls are not Bible believers and they don't read the Bible because all they want to do is go around and speak evil. That proves to me that they don't even know what they're talking about and they're not Bible believers because otherwise they'd follow the Bible and wouldn't say dumb things about people. But they do. So we got to have a little grace with them and that's what the Bible teaches, to have grace. And I do. I very seldom talk about them. As a matter of fact, one of my New Year's resolutions, I guess starting now, is to try not to talk about the trolls that talk about me. But it's really sad. If you follow those trolls, just remember, are they giving you scripture? Are they giving you opinion? Revelation 3.3 says if you're not looking, you won't know. Alright, they're not looking, so they don't know. But the opposite of that is if you are watching, you will know. And I'm watching, and I'm reading, and I'm looking, and I'm lo longing, and I'm yearning for the coming of my Savior. And he's given us some clues in the Bible of when he's coming back. Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 says, Come and let us reason unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, what is this talking about? Well, if you know your Bible and you rightly divide, you know there was a guy named Daniel and God gave Daniel this prophecy of 70 weeks. And I don't have time to get into that, but you know that the end of that prophecy is a seven year tribulation. And the tribulation time is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And so you've got this tribulation time, this, this last week of Daniel. And it's uh, three and a half years and three and a half years. That's seven. And this is when the time when the Antichrist shows up. And this is also the time in which God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel that rejected their Messiah. So this is going to take place in the future. Now what's got to take place before that? The rapture to get the church out. So somewhere from 
back here from when Jesus died. It says it'll be after two days and in the third day. Well, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, it says a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as is one day. You know what's interesting? Here we are in the year 2020, actually. Now, if you count from when Jesus died in 33 AD, well, 2,000 years exactly would be 2033. Okay? Now, seven-year tribulation minus seven, what was that bringing out to? 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. 2026. So some people think, well, the rapture's going to be in 2026. Well, I'm not going to say that, but I'm asking the question. One of the clues in the Bible of when the rapture will be is after two days or 2,000 years. So I'm looking at my Bible, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm looking at the dates, and I'm like, wow, we're pretty close to 2,000 years after the death of Christ. <laughs> so, wow, we're very close to the rapture. Amen? Number two, the Apostle Paul gives us some clues of when the rapture would be. And this clue is in 2 Thessalonians. As a matter of fact, these two clues are actually in the same passage. 2 Thessalonians, verse 1 through 3. And we have two things mentioned here. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. I'm just giving you Bible today. Amen? Not my opinion. I'm not interested in what I think. I'm interested in what does God say. Amen? So let's go to 2 Thessalonians. And here we have the Apostle Paul writing to us. Of course, the Holy Spirit in him writing to us. He, he is just the vessel that God used. So this is the Holy Spirit giving us clues as to when the rapture will be. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. What's the gathering together unto him? The rapture. So the context is the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand, which is what? The rapture. Not the day of the Lord. New versions change this and mess up everything. No, the day of Christ is when Jesus is coming at the rapture. The day of Christ is at hand. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come two things. The rapture cannot come to pass until these two things happen. Number one, the falling away. We call that the apostasy. Falling away. Well, here we are today in a day and age of apostasy, in which many have fallen away from sound doctrine. So, yeah, we're here. The apostasy is here, so the rapture can come. It says that except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the man of sin has to be revealed. Now, who is the man of sin? And why does he have two names? If you have a King James Bible, look what it says there. The man of sin be revealed. Comma, the son of perdition. So the man of sin is the Antichrist. But he's got two names. He's called the man of sin, the M-O-S, and he's called the son of perdition, S-O-P. Why does he have two names? Well, if you read your book of Revelation in your Bible, you find out when the Antichrist comes, he comes as a man. And for that seven years, he has a pact with Israel, and in the middle of that, he breaks that pact. And it's around that time that the Antichrist is assassinated. And we read in the book of Revelation that he has a deadly wound. Well, what does that mean? That means he's killed. He's assassinated. But then his deadly wound is healed, and the whole world wonders after the beast. What happens? The devil enters into him. Just as back here in the ministry of Christ, the devil entered into Judas. What was Judas called? The son of perdition. Here's the son of perdition. The son of perdition will be the Antichrist with the devil incarnate inside of him. So you have two names given to the Antichrist. First is man of sin. Second is son of perdition. And that's why. But Paul tells us one of the clues of the rapture is that the rapture cannot come until the man of sin be revealed. So the very moment that the Antichrist comes onto the world scene, that's when the rapture takes place. You see, I had one guy say, well, this breaker guy, well, he, he has people waiting for the Antichrist rather, rather than waiting for Jesus. <laughs> You're so pious, aren't you? How funny. No, I'm just giving you what the Bible says. Let's read it together. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So as soon as the man of sin is revealed. Now how is he revealed? Now, that I don't know exactly. My thought is, he's voted in as the head of the United Nations, because the devil's going to use the United Nations for his new world order, and the head of the United Nations would be the one world leader. So, <clears throat> someday... We might hear in the news, there's an ele election for the new head of the United Nations, the new president. And they vote, and he comes out, such and such has been voted as the new head of the United Nations. And then all of a sudden, boop, 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 there's the trumpet, and we go up immediately. But that's a clue. That's a clue that Paul said. Paul says, look, you can't have the rapture unless there's first the falling away, the apostasy. And as soon as the man of sin is revealed, then that comes. Then the man of sin rules for three and a half years, is assassinated, and then the devil enters into him for the final three and a half years of the tribulation. These are just clues in the Bible that cannot be denied. This is what the Bible says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a clue given us by the Apostle Paul of when the rapture will be. Okay, Paul, when is the rapture going to be? Well, he doesn't say, on December 29th, whatever. <laughs> Paul says the rapture is going to take place when this happens, and when this happens, and right before this happens, and, and things like that. Well, here's another clue, and Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, when the rapture will be. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump... For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He says, it's coming at the last trump. Now, a lot of debate over what does this mean. A lot of people say, well, that means the, the second uh, term of, of President Trump in office. And, they, and they're saying, when it talks about the last trump, that's Donald Trump. And a lot of people laugh that off and say, ah, ha, ha, ha. But it is interesting that the word Trump is in the Bible. <coughs> You know, I don't know if it's literally talking about Trump or not, but I find it's interesting. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Cyrus. And one of the prophets prophesied of King Cyrus, what, 100, 200 years before he showed up? By name in the Bible. If God could do that in the Old Testament, name a guy before he shows up, well, he could certainly do it in the New Testament. I don't know. But it's interesting. We have a Trump as president. But the Jewish tradition says that the last Trump is the blowing of the trumpet on one of the feast days. And I don't have time to get into that. I've talked about that in my other videos. Some people say that the last trump is what they call the last blow of the trumpet on the Feast of Trumpets. And it is the last of the 100 uh, trumpet blows. And the last one is called the last trump. But that's interesting. That brings us to a feast. And that brings us to the seven feasts in the Bible. And Paul, when he talks about Christ... He talks about Jesus as as one of the as as fulfilling the feasts of Israel. Remember, he called Jesus Christ the Passover. Well, Passover is a feast. Well, he also talks about those that rose again during the time of Christ's ministry as one of the feasts, the feast of first fruits. Let me go there with you. First Corinthians, chapter fifteen. We're, we're there. We should be there. And let's go to verse twenty through twenty-three. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. <clears throat> but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So he's talking about him as the first fruits. But the first fruits, that's one of the feasts of Israel. What's that have to do with anything? Unless the seven feasts correspond with the life of Christ and his comings. And that's what it appears to do. If you get a chance, look up one of my YouTube videos entitled The Seven uh, Feasts of Israel. It'll be quite eye-opening to you. The feasts were all types of something that takes place in the time of Christ. Um, there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Jesus Christ is going to give life to everyone. Some people resurrected when Jesus resurrected here. The rapture is a resurrection. And so the rapture is coming. And look what it says about the rapture in verse 23. But every man in his order, Christ, the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Well, that's a rapture reference. The rapture reference is Christ is coming. And it ties the rapture into having to do with the feasts. 
Christ was the Passover lamb that died. What was the next feast? Pentecost. But then there was the first fruits. And so somehow, according to the Apostle Paul, the rapture is probably tied into one of the seven feasts. Now some people say, well, it's got to be Pentecost, or it's got to be Passover. Some people think it's a spring feast. Other people say, no, it's definitely, the rapture's got to be on the Feast of, Tabra, uh, of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. And that could be. It could be that the last trump is indeed a reference to the last trump of a feast. Trumpet blow. All right, another uh, thing is Revelation 12. <clears throat> now here's something that uh, some Christians are debating, and I find that interesting. If you're a Bible believer, you just go by what the Bible says, and you believe it. Well, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, the Apostle John tells us something. And what book is this? It's the book of Revelation, which is a book that Jesus said was given to tell us things that will shortly come to pass. So the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy to tell us about things that are coming to pass in the future. And it's the revelation of Jesus to John for us today. Now, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, John tells us something that he saw in heaven. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of this. I don't have time to get into this. But there is something that took place on September 23rd, <coughs> 2017. And a lot of people say, oh, it was nothing. Many Christians don't even know what happened. <laughs> But in the history of the world, the stars never look like this. But all of a sudden, on, on September 23rd, 2017, somebody said, Hey, look up in the heavens at the constellation Virgo, which is a woman. And look what it says there about her, how she's clothed with the sun and had the moon on her feet, and she has these 12 stars. And, and it all lines up with the constellation Virgo, all exactly as described here. So some people have connected the dots and said, well, that's that. So Revelation 12 is, is, is a marker in history in which God is saying, if you look up at the stars and see them, and you want to know the time periods, and you want to know the times and the seasons, I'm marking that there's a future event that's going to take place in about 2,000 years that, that you watch that day, and then you realize, hey, now, get ready. God is saying, I'm going to go do something for Israel. Now, a lot of people that claim to be Christians, many of them say, Revelation 12, that's not talking about the Virgo thing in the constellation. <laughs> okay, well, I guess you're just blind. I don't see how you can't look at the constellation Virgo and see all the 12 stars around her and everything and not say, well, wow, that looks exactly what, what he was explaining. I don't see how you can miss that. But if you want to miss it, you help yourself. You see, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant still, the Bible says. There are a lot of people that want to be ignorant. And a lot of people say, we as Christians, we shouldn't be looking at the stars. Okay, you, you can believe that if you want. Matter of fact, some have ignoramiously, I don't know any other word to say it, ignoramiously have said, oh, looking at the stars, well, that's an astrology. <laughs> are you serious? Do you even read your Bible? I doubt it. Do you know there's a difference between astronomy and astrology? Astrology is evil. I am very much against astrology, which is looking at the stars and trying to use the stars to put forth a, a horoscope or some sort of uh, a, a divination for your personal life. And that is wrong. We don't look at the stars and then make our decisions in life based upon what we see in the stars. That would be evil. That would be wrong. That is astrology. Astronomy is studying the stars, looking at what's actually there, learning what the names are, and, and they're up there. How someone could say it's wrong to look up, I don't understand. David did. Psalms chapter 8 and verse 3, David said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. Okay, so David was an astrologist because he looked up and considered the heavens? No. He was a king of Israel that loved to study, that loved to learn, and he studied, and he looked, and he looked up, and he learned about the stars. And he says, well, that's cool. All right, what about Job? Job chapter 35 and verse 5. 
Look unto the heavens, and see, and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. Here's a command from God for us to look up at the heavens. It must be okay for a Christian to look at the heavens then. There must be a difference between astrology and astronomy if the Bible tells us it's okay to look at the stars and to look up. Matter of fact, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51. I get so put out a lot of times by these people that claim to be Christians. And rather than looking at the Bible and looking at, hey, wow, look how close we are to Jesus' return, they just want to look at other Christians and try to nitpick and criticize and attack them. What a foolish thing to do, talking about other Christians, when we could be having a great Bible study and talking about the Lord. <laughs> That's what we should be doing. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation be, shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. It says here, lift up your eyes to the heavens. The Bible says to look at the heavens. So, we do. Now, we don't have to base our doctrine upon what we see in the heavens, and that's not what I'm doing. I'm just thinking, wow, isn't it interesting? You read the Bible... And then you look at what happened on that day, and you go, wow, that sounds like what happened on that day. What does it mean? Well, that's the question. What are the stars for? Well, the Bible says God gave them for signs. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Why did God make the stars in heaven? Well, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. Very first book in the Bible. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days, and for years. So God says, in the very beginning of the Bible, I made the stars in the heavens for signs to be markers of the seasons. So it's the Bible says, Paul says, brethren, you're not ignorant of these things. You know, he says that uh, we're supposed to know the times and the seasons. <laughs> Isn't it? So God gave these things in the heaven as markers for signs. Now, some people say, well, signs are for the Jews. Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. So as a Christian, I'm not looking up at the heavens and, and expecting God to speak to me from them. But I do look at what the Bible says and who they're supposed to be speaking to. And as I read the Bible, I go, oh, okay. So God made those as, as signs for the seasons. And the people that look for signs more than anything else are the Jews. So, hey, Jew, if you're a Jew, look up at the heaven and tell me what you see. Well, if you're a Jew and you look up at the heaven, guess what you're supposed to be looking at? The signs. And if you're looking at the signs, guess what happened after September 23rd, 2017? The most amazing thing in the entire world happened for the Jewish nation. What was it? The Jews came back into their land in, in 1947 under a UN mandate that said they could. And in 1948, the Jews set up themselves a government, and that started the nation of Israel in 1948. Seventy years later, they celebrated 70 years as a nation in 2018. But they didn't have a capital. But in December 6th, December 6th, 2017, this guy named Trump stood up and he declared, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. So the first time in almost 2,000 years, Israel not only had their nation back, they got a capital of Jerusalem back again. Now why is that a big deal? People say, oh, Robert Breaker, <gasps> big deal. It is a big deal. Because we have the Bible. And the Bible promises us that Jesus Christ will return to this earth someday and will set his throne in Jerusalem in the house of David and will sit on the throne where he will rule and reign for a thousand years. So Jesus will rule for 1,000 years on the throne of David, and David's kingdom was, the capital of, of it was Jerusalem. But you say, oh, big coincidence, Robert Breaker. You're just not telling me anything important. <laughs> okay. Well, I just find it more 
than just coincidence that this thing took place and it was this sign and who are supposed to be looking for signs? The Jews, according to 1 Corinthians. So Jews, wake up and realize you are very close to the coming of your Messiah. He came once and you rejected him, so he's coming back again. He's going to send you some witnesses, though, first. So what is that sign pointing to? That very shortly God's going to go back to dealing with the nation of Israel. So there are many clues in the Bible. Let me show you another clue. This is an important, important clue. People say, no, where in the Bible does it give us the date of the rapture? But there's so many clues that point to when it'll be. And they all keep pointing to really soon, really soon. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Here's a clue from Jesus himself. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Jesus is speaking to Israel. And he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So Matthew 24, 34 is a clue from Jesus about the generation. Now who is he talking to and what is he talking about? They came to him and asked him, what's going to be about the last days? Well, there's going to be a generation of Jews that live in the nation of Israel in the last days. Well, guess what? 1948, they started a nation again. There's people over there living in Israel that are Jews. And Jesus said, now this is going to be in the last days. And then he said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And you read chapter 24, and it's all about the tribulation period. Now, that raises the question, how long is a generation? How many years? Let's go back to Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. In Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, here we find out what the Bible looks at as the age of a generation. Psalms 90 verse 10 says the days of our years are three score years and ten. Now three score, well a score is twenty, so three score would be uh, sixty and ten, so seventy. And if by reason of strength they shall be four score years, so it would be eighty. Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. <laughs> I think that's interesting. We fly away. But anyway, it says, so in the Bible, a generation is between 70 to 80 years. That's what God looks at as a generation according to the Bible. All right, so you take 1948, you add 70, you get 2018. If you add 80, you would get 2028. So somewhere between 2018 to 2028. Is that the end of the generation, 2028? Well, if so, you'd have to take away seven for the tribulation. That'd be, what, 2021 rapture? <laughs> wow, if the rapture was in 2021, that's next year. <laughs> wow, that means we must not be too far away from... All I'm doing is connecting the dots. I'm not setting a date, am I? I'm giving you a Bible study where we're looking at what the Bible says, we're looking at events, we're looking at the revelation. And it says, if you watch, you will know. And I'm watching, and I'm putting things together, and I'm reading the Bible, and I'm going, wow, it looks like we're going to be really close to the rapture of Christ. Could it be in 2020? I hope so. So when can the rapture be? Well, I'm going to close with this. I didn't want to go too long in this. I'm already losing my voice from being gone and preaching in uh, Kansas the end of last year and still haven't quite got over that and got better yet. And I'm already out of room up here. <laughs> but let's look at this. When will the rapture be? Don't know. I'm not dogmatically telling you because I don't know, but I can sure uh, ask questions. I can sure look at this and say, I wonder, and here's what I wonder. 2,000 years, we're told in Hosea, all right? If you take that literally, and I do, then 2033 would be as long as you can go. So you take 2033 and you subtract 7 for a 7 year tribulation and what do you come up to? 2026? So is there a 2026 rapture? Oh Brother Brager, that's too long. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That is too far away. That, that'd be another 6 years. I hate to wait that long. But with the way things are going in the world, man, it looks like it could be this year. But I don't see how it could be any later than 2026. I really don't, if you put all these dots together.
Now, some people say, well, Brother Breaker, you're so wrong. The calendar is off two years. Oh, it is. Well, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Okay, well, then let's redo the math. That would be 2031 minus 7. Why, that'd be a 2024 rapture, if you're right and the calendar is off. But I don't know. Some people say, no, Brother Breaker, you know, the old guy, uh, Bishop Usher, or whoever it was, he proved that the calendar is actually four years off. Okay, so it would really be 2029. Subtract 7, you get 2022. Wow, that's only two years away. <laughs> that's not a long ways off. But, you got to keep going back to this generation thing. If a generation is indeed 80 years then it would have to be when? If 2028, you'd have to subtract 7. Why, wouldn't that make it a 2021 rapture? Because those people can't be any older than 80? Well, that's next year. So all these things, as we continue reading the Bible and studying and looking at what the clues are of when the rapture will be, it's like it's looking like the rapture could be any time could even be this year. Now here's something that I thought about. There was a big thing on internet in December of 2019. Many people were claiming that the rapture was going to be on this day. And I went out of my way to not say anything about it. Of course I was so busy I wouldn't even have time to make a video anyway. But a lot of people said December 21st, 2019 will be the rapture. And I kind of looked into that, and I just kind of said, well, I hope so, but if not, okay, there's lots to do. I was actually in a, in a conference teaching on the seven mysteries in the Bible in, in Kansas, so I didn't have time to stop. I just kept studying. But why did they say that? Well, do you remember 2012 and all the big hype about 2012? In 2012, everyone said, the, the world is going to end on December 21st, 2012. The Mayan calendar has prophesied December 21st, 2012, as the end of the world. And so a lot of people says, well, that was seven years before, so seven years later. Now, where do they get seven years? Well, the Bible has a lot of neat stuff in it. And a lot of things that take place in the Old Testament um, have a lot of things that uh, correspond to the New Testament because those are prophecies in the Old Testament. And we have the book of Genesis, and in chapter 41 of the book of Genesis, we have something that, that I always thought about and always thought was interesting. We have this guy named Joseph, and God protects Israel through this man named Joseph, but he gives him seven good years to prepare for the coming seven bad years. Now those seven bad years, well, that would correspond with the seven-year tribulation. So before the seven bad years, we had seven good years. And so some people were thinking, well, December 21st, 2012, well, that's not the end of the world. The, the Mayans actually said that's the beginning of a new era or something. They said, what if that's the beginning of the seven good years? All right, then the rapture should be in December 21st, 2019. That's seven years later, so that's the end of the good... Now they're saying, well, it didn't work, did it? <laughs> a lot of times people set a date, and they shouldn't. I've never set a date. I've never said the rapture will be on such and such a date. I've always thrown stuff out and said, hey, let's look at this, and you make up your own mind. I'm not saying it's going to happen on such and such a day, but I'm also at the same time not going to go stick my head in the sand and say, I can't even look at the Bible. I can and I will, because I love my Lord, and I want Him to come, and I'm looking, and I'm connecting the dots, and I'm looking at the clues, and I think it's fun to try to look at the puzzle and solve it, if possible. So that's what I'm doing. So, it didn't work. There was no rapture in 2019. But, what are seven years? Well, if you're, I've got a girl that's, uh, well, she's eight now, but she was seven years old. And when she was seven years old, eight, nine, ten months later, she was still seven years old. So, seven years is still seven years, even several months after. And if God's still working on the feast day thing, then... Uh, after this date, the first feast, wouldn't that be the rapture? So that's why people say 2020, 2020 on one of the feast days. And that's coming up real soon. And that's kind of interesting because this year we have planned, now we haven't bought our tickets yet, but we're still planning, on going to Israel around April. 
and uh, shortly after the Passover, and I'll be there with another brother during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, when would we be able to make the trip? Will the rapture come first? Well, that'd be fine with me. I'll get to see Jerusalem and Israel for a thousand years in the future. That'd be great. But uh, is it a spring rapture? Is it a fall rapture? Could the rapture be in Feast of Trumpets 2020? I don't know. All I'm doing is reading my Bible and trying to connect the dots. A lot of people are talking about this, though, in the seven good years. First, and seven bad years. You remember September 23rd, uh, 2015? I did a video on that because all over the internet people were talking about that date. Because people were talking about the Star of Bethlehem and how it's up in the heavens again. And we read about that in the birth of Christ. How there's the Star of Bethlehem and that star comes and marks the birth of Jesus. Well, on September 23rd, 2015, that star showed up again. And people said, well, then, then that's the start of the seven good years, so you add seven. Well, you add seven to 2015, what do you get? Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You get 2022. So some people say, see, so the rapture's going to be 2022, and it all worked. I don't know. What I'm trying to show you is there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of different math, getting together, trying to figure out a lot of different ways, when's the rapture? I don't claim to know. Other people say, no, that not September 23rd, 2015. It was in 2017, September 23rd. And so you got to add 7. So you add 7 to that, that's 2024. So they say the rapture is going to be in 2024. I don't know. I don't know if that 7 good years has anything to do with it, although it is there in type. But I do find it interesting that December 6, 2017, Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's just, to me, that's right after September 23rd. Not even a couple months later, God says, Now, Jerusalem is the capital of my people, and I want the world to know it. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. We know that after the rapture, God goes back to dealing with Israel, so we must be close. How close? Are we this year? Are we six years away? Whatever it is, the rapture's going to be soon. What if there was something to the whole 2012 thing? Well, the end of 2012, because December 21st is the end of 2012, so that starts a new year, 2013. So 2013 plus 7 is 2020. <laughs> rapture in 2020? Possibly. Possibly. Um, seven good years start. In 20 I think it's interesting that after this, this the 2012 thing, you had all this talk in 2014 and 2015 about the blood moon tetrads. And today people are going, oh, see, that meant nothing. Oh, really? You start studying these blood moons, and they all tie in somehow with the history of Israel. And so you got 2013, 2014, these blood moon tetrads. Then in 2017, God gives Israel their capital back. You think God was giving a sign to the Jews? Hey, get ready, because real soon I'm coming back to deal with you. I'm going to get my bride first, but then when I get her, I'll come back to you and deal with you. Fulfill all my promises to you in the Old Testament. So, when is the rapture? I don't know. Could it be in 2020? Boy, wouldn't that be great? Everything's in place. I, I don't see how it couldn't be. But then again, I don't know what God's doing. I know He's doing different things. I know He's given as many clues as when the rapture is going to be. I don't know the day or hour, but I'm going to keep connecting the dots. Because I got a promise that said, if I'm watching, then I'll know. And I think the closer we get, the more obvious it will be. Hey, the rapture's coming. The rapture's coming. 2020 would be a great time and a great year for the rapture. One thing for sure that I think I could say <laughs> is at least we're in the new decade, and during this decade will be the rapture. I do believe that within the next 10 years, we'll see the rapture of the church. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So, <laughs> they'll probably have rounded up and killed all Christians by then, so whatever. But if you read the Bible, if you believe the Bible, 
you connect the dots, you look at the clues, man, we are close. What day, what hour, I don't know. But it sure is fun to study and try to connect the dots and get it together. So I hope this is a blessing to you. I appreciate you watching. Uh, in this year, 2020, make sure you put God first. And go out there and win souls to Jesus. People need to be saved. And it's up to you to get them the gospel. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.